That Great Business Show, Ireland's best business podcast. ThatGreatBusinessShow.com is brought to you by De Facto Shaving Oil, the best anyone can get. Made in Ireland, sold worldwide. Welcome to episode 103 of That Great Business Show, hosting on the 2nd of September 2022. I am Conal O'Moran. For reasons that will become very obvious, this is a most unusual episode. An episode that will try, with your help, to do something to fix Ireland's broken health system. On episode 90, we were joined by Professor Martin Curley of Maynooth University, who also happens to be the head of digital transformation at the HSE. Martin, you may remember, has a PhD in electronic engineering and was a VP for research at Intel for many years. In other words, as far as Team GBS is concerned, he has the creds. Today, we can exclusively announce that Martin has a new job. I'm delighted to say that he's going to co-host this episode, where we are introducing some of the most exciting medtech companies in the country to you. Companies that Martin says will help fulfill his ambition of moving Ireland's health system from 80th, that's 80, to number one in Europe. I've spoken to a lot, a lot of people about episode 90, that's the one in which Martin starred, and the response genuinely was phenomenal. Though I have to be honest and say that most people were, well, hmm, sceptical. The most common response, whilst hoping it might be true, was, uh, good luck with that. Professor Dr. Martin Curley, welcome back to That Great Business Show. We've already chatted, so you know the drill. You ask the intelligent questions and I'll hum along in the background. Fantastic, Conan. Wonderful to be back here and co-hosting. What an honour, actually. Yeah, I'll be telling my grandkids this. So. <laughs> Not an honour, Martin. We still want to drill into this to find out what you claim that you can fix the Irish Health Service. You are one amongst one who believes that because nobody else does. Well, we actually have an army and I have a couple of colleagues uh, with me today who are actually going to provide real evidence and this is episode 103 and that's actually apt because I was down with uh, Linda O'Leary in Wexford General Hospital a few weeks ago and they're now running at 103% capacity so they're plus 19. You know, Linda runs a very tight ship but we're in midsummer, and the hospitals are full fuller than actually are in the deepest of, of winter. So we, we have a real crisis. So there are two things that we need to do. One, we need to immediately address this crisis. And some of my colleagues here today actually have real solutions that are clinically proven and we just need to scale. And we also then need to re-architect or create a whole new health system. And I would talk about it as a Copernican revolution. Uh, so we want to stand up a health and wellness system using digital technology. Today, we have an illness system Today, it's focused on the hospital and it's focused on the doctor and the three shifts are going to happen. Will A, it's going to be focused on wellness. B, it's actually going to be focused on the patient because the, the patient knows best, not the doctor knows best. And actually, if you need a hospital, it's going to be in the home. So that's that's where we start. But uh, excited to have the dialogue today. And you're not going to use that thing about keep left, go left, 3x, 10x or whatever, no? <laughs> Absolutely. Stay left, shift left, 10x. So it means keeping people well at home. But if you happen then to get sick, we'll get you as home quickly as possible. But the key part is 10x. With digital technology, we can do so much better. And you're going to hear from, from John very shortly and Ronan and wonderful things that they're doing in the space of diagnostic and x-rays particularly excited about Dermot and Anne, two sisters who are going to talk about our health elevator project that goes live th live this month. And we're going to actually attack disease before it even starts. You're ruining my intros, but we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> and before I do that, as always, these great tips and insights are brought to you by De Facto. That is the world's best shaving oil. Not a beard oil, it's for everyone, man or woman. And because it's only nail varnished size, it's ideal for packing into your travel wash bag. DeFactoShave.com. Buy it right now. And can uh, I give an unscripted shout out to Tom? I've been using it and it's absolutely yes. wonderful. So, you know, very, uh, very sustainable as well. So well done, Tom. That's Tom, Tom Murphy, founder, maker of DeFactoShave.com. 
Great Business Show Irish Podcast Awards 2022 Best Business Podcast Nominee. De facto shaving oil, smooth as. So, you heard voices in the background there more than a year ago on episode 47. More than a year ago. We had Mitchell O'Gorman of X-Wave on the podcast. Their health solution software does something so stupidly simple. As someone must have said about the wheel, why didn't someone think of this before? But wheels don't send you to get the correct medical tests and only those tests because that's what X-Wave does. And they claim this can clear certain test backlogs in just 12 months. So with that promise, we just had to have the relatively early stage Irish company X-Wave back again. And this time they've sent even bigger guns, John Sheehan and Ronan Killeen, top radiologists and company founders both, who like to be known as the happy pair of radiology. They're also here to talk about mobile medical diagnostics or MMD to those in the know. John Sheehan, Ronan Killeen, welcome to That Great Business Show. Thank you, Martin. Great to Thank be here. Thank you very much. No, no, I'm Connell. Martin's over there. <laughs> <laughs> You're meant to be bright boys. <laughs> it's just I'm starstruck. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, we are going to be stuck for time, so let's get straight into the meat. You're a vegan. <laughs> yes, how did you know? <laughs> X-Wave, tell me exactly what will it do? Well, I think Ronan is probably the best one to tell you about X-Wave. I can tell you all about mobile medical diagnostics. Well, Ronan, so talk Ronan, to me to about you. X-Wave. Sure, yeah. So, thanks, Colin. Thanks for the invitation. I appreciate it a lot. Um, so, X-Wave is essentially a technology company, and the point of the company is to save lives by so making sure patients get the best tests first, and in doing so, reduce radiology waiting lists. Um, so, it might sound like a, a very complex task, but or an unusual task, but effectively in radiology, one thing that people might be aware of is that a lot of tests that are ordered don't provide any value for patients. And in the US, the FDA estimate that to be somewhere between 20 and 50%. And in Europe, similar estimates. So very significant portion of tests, and therefore those who are on waiting lists or contributing to waiting lists are tests that don't provide value. And if you put that in the patient context, that means that you end up with delayed diagnosis, you end up with poor access, you end up with larger waiting lists, and you end up with massive cost to health systems. So what X-Wave Technologies has done is it's built a point of care clinical system support. It's effectively like a radiologist in your pocket, helps you choose the best test um, for the patient the first time, um, which then can eliminate those delays in diagnosis. Um, in terms of some of the uh, early things that we found, there's really three fronts. Um, one, when you convert to a digital transformation, you get massive efficiencies, right, aside from the appropriate test. And we found that um, from an audit before we started our implementation, the average time it took for a referral to be made, to be reviewed by a radiology team, to be sent, to be scheduled, which is what happens before they call you to say, can you come in next Tuesday for your scan? That took about seven and a half days in an eight patient context. So that's one and a half working weeks, right? So you go home for a week and a half. And at that point, then you can be phoned to say, hey, you have an appointment in three months time or six months time, depending on the hospital. Uh, when we implemented our system, that time came down to 14 minutes. Okay, so that's a 99.6% reduction. And I've done the maths for Martin. I was Martin. going to say you did that one. Martin, <laughs> Martin loves the X's. So that's a 250X reduction in the time, okay? So that means that as you're getting in your car after your appointment, somebody could phone you and say, hey, everything's been done and we now can arrange your appointment. So you're already ahead of the game by a week and a half. The second thing that we found was a, a, a behavioral thing. Because we display the x-ray symbology within the app, so effectively the doctor goes in, puts in your symptoms, it takes your demographics, it takes the latest evidence-based guidelines from two major organizations in the world, presents them back to you in a simple digestible format so the, the referrer can see it just instantly what they want to do. Key thing, the referrer is autonomous. They make the decision. Okay, so that remains with them. They choose the test they want. One of the things, one of the hospitals that were deployed and audited the referrals they got, and they found that the chances of getting a test that didn't administer radiation to the patient was much higher after implementation of the software. That means that there's a response to seeing those radiation symbols beside those tests that administer radiation. That's very important from a regulatory standpoint and from a European standpoint, because you're reducing the dose of radiation to patients. And the last bit, point three, and this is the last one, right? The big one was that advanced imaging requests decreased by 8%, okay? 
So we've shown massive efficiency, reduction in radiation dose for patients, and a reduction in 8% of advanced imaging. The waiting list in Ireland, and I know it's a business podcast, and you guys love numbers, that's why I'm giving you all the numbers, right, is 6% of the total volume. So if we can take out 8% of the orders, we can clear the waiting list. How quickly? And I think within about 12 months of full deployment. And you already have evidence from the eye and ear in St. Vincent. So this is not some sort of pie in the sky. You actually real evidence from Ireland that this, yeah, this can be and there's, there's also in, in international randomized control trials of, of similar types of information systems that can do this. Yes, there's evidence beyond Ireland as well. Yeah. Question, quick answer. <laughs> How come this hasn't been done elsewhere before? Um, ooh, well, it ha- so in Ireland, actually, we've brought in guidelines, but they're not point-of-care guidelines. So we currently use the Royal College of Radiology IRFR guidelines, which you have to go onto a website, log in, look up the test you want, look up the symptoms of your patient, and then go back to your ordering system and order your test. And if you imagine how busy clinicians are, that's just not feasible. And we know that from research that was done in the Matter Hospital that that actually didn't have an impact they assessed thousands of x-rays pre and post implementation. They found no change in the appropriateness of the scans after implementation of those types of guidelines. So we're point of care. We're inside the system. No other, effort required. Other businesses doing similar stuff around the world. Anybody? Yeah, in the US. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in, in the US, this has been implemented. And in fact, in the US, some of the insurers are now insisting on this type of a system in order to pay for uh, the scans that are done. Let's go over to John. MMD. Is that it? Yes, mobile medical diagnostics. Talk uh, to us about that. And uh, Martin, you better ask these intelligent questions that I'm not asking. Well, we just heard a brilliant example of a 10x technology, but what MMD does is actually a 10x technology. We're looking at the quadruple aim, better care, lower cost, better quality of life, better experience. Share with us, John, what's happening and what's happened so far. Well, I know we're all here to talk about the present and the future, which is going to be better. But just to bring you a little bit back to the past, Mobile medical diagnostics is providing x-rays in a mobile environment in the community to patients in hospices and nursing homes. But would you believe it, Marie Curie, uh, an amazing woman uh, back in World War I, had gathered together an x-ray machine, put it in a van and got 600 nurses to drive through the battlefields and take x-rays of soldiers with fractures and bullets. When I was a kid, there used to be uh, mobile x-ray machines, weren't there? Vans, brown vans. That dr- oh, geez, they're all looking at me. As if I was born in about <laughs> This is an alternative universe. Was I, I remember that such and such a van would call around to... Measure your feet? Come in t- into towns and villages. I'm a, I'm th- bet you I'm right. Anyway, back to MMD. <laughs> well, well, back to World War One, and then <laughs> skip forward to uh, about four years ago, uh, Mary Jones, uh, another Who's nurse. been on the podcast. Yeah. Um, she had uh, a father and a father-in-law, both with um, nursing home occupancy due to dementia and Parkinson's. And she saw the absolute trauma, um, huge um, consumption of time and resources and the negative impacts of a patient in a nursing home needing to go by ambulance to a hospital and get an x-ray. And she said, why are we moving the patients? Let's move the equipment. So that is the um, uh, kind of mission statement of of mobile medical diagnostics. So as I said, it provides x-rays in the community to, you know, all sorts of people. Um, And in fact, actually, it's incredible that we are the only company in the UK and Ireland doing this. Kind of odd. It is odd. And actually, Why here, is it odd, here's though? a really odd thing. We're the only company we believe in Europe who've got a license to do x-rays in people's homes. So we can do it in the comfort of your home. That's an extraordinary convenience if you think about the disruption of and there's a big piece, Conal, here about like the data already. I think you've done more than a thousand x-rays and uh, as I understand, over 90,000 of those or 90% didn't require a transfer to the hospital. Now, I want to be just accurate here, Martin. 90% is just not good enough. It was 89%. <laughs> uh, and actually, it's it's extraordinary. 80- I'm surrounded by a bunch of nerds here. <laughs> <laughs> but, but let, let's, you know, the facts are always friendly. We need to stick with the facts. So actually, consistently, it's 89% of patients when they get the x-ray, the diagnosis uh, comes up whereby their management plan is altered and they don't need to go to hospital. That's a massive impact 
on the patient, the nursing home, the family, ED and hospital avoidance, um, and, and just the overall costs uh, and disruption. So essentially what it's doing is it's doing a 10x faster, better, cheaper for all of the stakeholders. Ronan Colleen is going to wipe out waiting lists in one year. What are you going to do? Well, we are um, currently used by over 160 nursing homes, uh, 150 GPs. And we have um, set up in Dublin, Cork. We're going to Limerick in uh, August. And then we actually plan, uh, intend to be nationwide uh, by 2023. So we're going to be everywhere. And we're going to be able to provide care in the community, medicalization of the, the nursing homes and the like, whereby we provide the Slauncher Care model of the right care, the right place, the right time. So it's absolutely, absolutely hitting the sweet spot out there in the community in real life. And, you know, as a radiologist who's into, you know, advanced imaging, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, it's quite profound, actually, when you look at the x-ray, as I've done a thousand times, and you see a 90-year-old with dementia, and you see a diagnosis on their image, or in fact, actually, that everything is fine. And you know that you've actually had an amazing impact on that patient. It's actually more rewarding than all of the other stuff that I do. And it's only a simple x-ray. Martin, what is holding up the implementation of both of these? Because they have been around for a few years. Okay, that's a loaded question. It's so a deliberately we, loaded question. We, so what, if I say, what are we waiting for, Robert? So let me let me say, look, I'm a huge fan of Robert and we just need to scale this. So there are discussions around creating a digital health agency, uh, which has been government policy since 2013. There's been two HICWA reports and we just need to, you know, get a move on with that because there is this culture Martin, war going Martin, on between Martin, the old system Martin, and the new. What's holding up? The implementation is just very simple. Putting the funding, this is you know the returns and some of, you know some of the numbers we've been looking at the returns. I I know we Ronan, you did the calculation on extra fare was a thirty two x return if you know or in or in or around that twenty seven mark twenty seven x. We just did a calculation last week on digital respiratory management the returns actually eleven thousand percent. So that's one hundred and ten. So we just need to get the focus of the government. There's three things that are needed. There's a political decision saying that we're going to do this. You need a strategy. We have a strategy called Stay Left, Shift Left, 10X. And we need an institution to do that. We call that institution the Digital Health Agency. And there is work going on in the background to stand us up. We're, you know, we're probably a decade late to do it. This is not different to anything that the policy, put the government's policy. It's actually the policy. So we just need to go and do this. So... Let's do it. And one of the reasons that what you're waiting for is the cash. And when you mention Robert, am I right in saying it's Robert Watt? Indeed, yeah. Well, uh, you better give Robert Watt a little bit of a shout out. Yeah, and Robert Watt, as, as he knows, was the person I, I said I would hire um, in a heartbeat. Now, unfortunately, Arsene Wenger wasn't available. <laughs> so, uh, so Robert is our man. So you know, I'd, be, I'd be confident Robert's come in, big reputation from deeper. He, he has inherited probably the worst healthcare system in the Northern Hemisphere. And that actually is a very challenging situation. Uh, but he's a good man. There's a lot of good people in the system. But the system, there's, you know, the system, the processes, the culture, they were all forged long before the digital revolution actually came along. So what we need to do is actually stand up a new system, reimagine it, architect it and engineer it from the ground up. And the good news is we can do this really quickly. Everybody thinks digital transformation is hard, requires lots of money. It does require some money, but it's way less harder than we think. We did remarkable things during covid what we need to recognise the oper the emergency we have now is actually far more serious than one we had with COVID. And the HSE mobilised very quickly during COVID because there was immediate threat. But people are kind of going back to the old ways, but the threat we have now in the emergency, and I defer to Ronan and John, who are on the front line and see it. Would you guys say we're in an emergency? We have, the system is very challenged and we're going to have a horrible winter unless we intervene very quickly. Well, the hospitals are, are, are sort of, they're functioning effectively at beyond capacity all the time, as you noted at the very start of the podcast. And um, I was making uh, the comment that I've heard much higher numbers than what you've mentioned there in some of the major hospitals around the city. And this is in the quiet time 
relatively speaking, as we come up to winter. So, yeah, it doesn't bode well for the coming winter. Martin, on episode 90, you said you're going to clean up the mess in 36 months. Do you still stand by that? Absolutely. We need a little cash, but uh, not too much. Okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. But when I look at these guys, John and Ronan and some of the other people, we're all committed. We're all Irish citizens. We're all professionals. We're going to do what it takes to fix this situation. Now, this is the best business podcast. You saw that? Yeah, this is That Great Business Show. We are a business show. And one of the things we ask every guest is, who, run clean, would you hire in a heartbeat? So, uh, my choice would be Prof. Dr. Matthias Goyen. He is the Chief Medical Officer of EMEA, GE Healthcare, a man who knows a lot about digital health and tech. Because I'm disappointed, Ronan, you didn't say me. (laughs) (laughs) And John, who would you go for? Well, actually, my first choice actually was going to be Martin, but I just know he's just too busy and not available. Um, so I had to go Try to, uh, <laughs> I had to go for uh, number two on the list, which is a really incredible guy called Stephen Plasco. Maybe many people haven't heard of him, but he's actually a doctor, OBGYN and entrepreneur himself. And he was the president and CEO of Jefferson uh, University and uh, healthcare system. And he really is progressive and innovative in his thinking. Um, and He actually says a really interesting thing. He says, if you are creative and the world around you is changing, you're going to be excited about that. And he's not afraid to take risk. And he says one really good thing. He says, what's going to be obvious in 10 years time from now? That's what you need to do today. So um, he would be my number one hire. See, he would have seen the wheel and he would have said, that's going to be a big one day. Yeah. <laughs> John Sheehan, Ronan Killeen of X Wave and of MMD Mobile Medical Diagnostics. Thank you so much for joining us on that great business show. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ronan. Thanks, John. That great business show, Irish Podcast Awards 2022. Best business podcast nominee. Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRedCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy to use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRedCloud.com, 100% Irish owned and a proud member of Team GBS. All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. That great business show. It was my old pal Plato who said that necessity was the mother of invention, but it was my other favourite, Team GBS, who said that frustration is the father of a great idea. You've got to admit, it's got a certain ring to it. Emergency medicine consultant Anne Shaw tells me that she got frustrated by what she calls the paternalistic model of patient care. So she and some other consultants got together to address the lack of understanding amongst patients of what was going on with their health. And so Full Health Medical, or FHM, was born. And then Anne was joined only a year ago by her brother Dermot. Over 12 years, they have developed algorithms and intelligence software to explain medical data in a clear graphic form that gets the message across in just 30 seconds, avoiding several doctor appointments. And short, Dermot Short, welcome to that great business show. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And let us start with you. Just describe what you do or what the business does. Well, you kind of have to take a step back and see why we do what we do, because um, I work in the ED and for... Emergency department. <laughs> no acronyms here. Emergency Martin department. Martin knows this because the cost. He had to pay over about 200 euro eventually. We charged 20 euro for acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> so no EDs. Emergency yeah. department. Emergency department. Yeah, and in the emergency department, it's really amazing. It's just so frustrating to see people come in um, with with strokes and with heart attacks and with really late and very obvious cancers. And there's been a timeline for several years that anybody could spot. And so 
when I started, this was out of frustration just to encourage people to be proactive about their health, to go and get their blood pressure measured. But it very quickly became apparent that there's no point in being proactive if nothing changes as a result. And these, you know, people, you would ask someone, the lad comes into the emergency department and you would ask him, you know, do you go to your GP? You know, what's your blood pressure normally like? He's like, I've a great GP. And he would tell you about his GP who's marvellous, who takes 20 bottles of blood every Every year of every colour does an ECG and blood pressure, you know, and what does he test for? I don't know. And, you know, what's your blood pressure? I don't know. They don't know that there are two numbers. They don't know what they are for. So there's no point whatsoever in this lad going in every year to do the same tests when nothing changes as a result. And then the kind of the core piece that we discovered that, that we really, when we sat down and, and, and tore off all the fluff, that the bit that was missing was a bit where the person explained, you know, this is a normal and this is you and you've got to do one, two and three or we'll keep going in a circle here. And so that's what we did. It started as a copybook exercise. And then over the last 10 years, we've nearly 200,000 people gone through at this point. And it's al- algorithms basically replace the doctor's brain. So it will tell you if I'm <laughs> sorry, it's a big long winded sentence. But if I'm looking at you and I'm going to tell you that your blood pressure is 140 over 90, but I will also think, do you smoke? Do you drink? Are you on Antihypertensive. And, and you're proactively intercepting disease. So you're proactively screening people to actually keep them well. And in the very early stages, you're identifying a problem and then educating and arming the patient to actually deal with that situation. Because earlier on, we talked about the Copernican revolution that's happening. So he a did. shift I didn't, from, I didn't even couldn't spell that. A shift from <laughs> illness to wellness, a shift from the doctor to the patient, and a shift from the hospital at home. So you had a brilliant insight. We had a fantastic conference in Tullamore in March and you know, our system is really struggling. But you came up with the insight. You know, well, what if we used our pharmacies, which are you know an underutilized resource? They all have you know consulting rooms which aren't used. And you came up with the idea, well, why not actually bring Full Health Medical to the pharmacies and do that on a national scale? And what would that do for us? No, it's, it's kind of a glaringly obvious solution when you stand back and look at it. You have... I really struggle to staff the emergency departments. We are about 2,000 GPs short generally and it's really hard to get a GP appointment. And here we have thousands and thousands of pharmacies, several in every village of really intelligent, high leaving cert points, highly trained primary care people who are just sitting there. They want the footfall, they want the experience, they want to be part of the team and they're largely ignored. And they all have a clinical room that is actually, for until COVID vaccinations, was it was a storeroom, it was vacant, it was just there out of necessity because they had to have one. So it's, it's, a, it's glaringly obvious and it's a very simple solution. And they've actually been fantastic. They have come on board um, with just huge enthusiasm for the project and it's going to go ahead. So tell us a little bit about Health Elevator <laughs> and Care Plus have been a fantastic pharmacy partner and you know others like Stack Pharmacies and Boots are going to fall in line. But what exactly happens with the Health Elevator? So with the Health Elevator, we connect. We're, we're a med tech company, we're software. So we connect the GP, um, the pharmacist and the patient to labs and we, we complete the circle. So everything from, you know, you book your appointment coming through to you answer your questionnaire, it's just all the inefficiencies are all taken out of it and, and the medicine is is there. But it because you use algorithms, you actually, uh, and the software, you can basically cut all of this down to, like, I can do 500 people in three hours. You know, as imagine, opposed to? Oh, as opposed to 500 multiplied by 15 minutes. And that's... If you're sitting in a GP surgery for 15 minutes, you do not explore how you're sleeping. You do not explore your diet. You you, you get to the you know the headline things. Your blood pressure's through the roof. Headline and, and 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 that alone, you don't actually dig deep deep dive. So you could go to your local pharmacy and in 15 minutes you can discover you know your general health. You can get educated and you can walk out with some tools that will help yep. maintain that wellness. That's fantastic. And it is a business because we better bring in Brother Dermot. <laughs> <laughs> Brother Dermot has had a 20 plus year career in filthy financial services. You were with UBS in London, but he then jumped and joined uh, the company because it's a proper business. Look, I was a a banker for 22 years and I started a software business uh, with another Irish guy actually, which is quite mature now as a business. I'm still the chairman there. 
Um, they better give it a shout out. It's a thin board. It's a thin board. It's a thin board. It's an investment management software. But the reality is, it's a software as a service business. And um, when I pulled out of the day to day and became chairman, um, uh, you know, Anne had been niggling me for years to 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 help out with full health. And honestly, is it is the most impactful thing I've ever done in my life. And I'd say that after a career in in, in London, um, I love it. Uh, what I really love is the, is how efficient you can make something. And the, the thing in this case is the doctor. You know, uh, you we we look at if you look at the Western world and you think about places like uh, in in finance, especially if you look at like Australia, uh, the, the, the the Netherlands, they have uh, uh, the responsibility for your financial. Uh, awareness has gone from the state to uh, individuals, right? And I think that change is going to happen everywhere because the state can't look after everybody. Now, if you want to um, make people's lives better and if you want to save bucket loads of money because we can't look after all these heart attacks and these strokes, you have to find these illnesses before they hit the emergency department. That's, That's the only way to do it. And to do that, you have to get people screened. It's a bit like, uh, you know, if you want to fly people to an airport, you have to get everybody through the screening facility. And all you're doing there is you're putting them through as fast as you can. And everybody who's normal or okay, let them through. And anybody who's got an issue, you're weeding them out. And, And effectively, what we're saying is we want to do the same thing. But you have to have a doctor involved. So what the what the team at Full Health have done is is basically looked at every single part of the workflow involved in giving somebody a medical, okay, and asked the very hard question, do we really need the doctor doing that particular part of it, right? So so there's old school medicals and I, I'm going to tell you about one I recently did in London because I had to do one for an insurance thing and, and it took me 90 minutes basically with this doctor and this is something you cannot scale, right? Because the doctor was with me physically for 90 minutes, right? So there's the appointment piece and then if you think about it, the doctor asks me lots of questions, right? So the doctor gets to, you know, ask about my family medical history, my medical history, you know, am I on medication, all that stuff, right? And then you have the, that's a whole set of data. There's a second set of data, which is uh, measurements the doctor takes, you know, my, my height, my weight, you know, my, my heart rate, my, my blood pressure, all that stuff. And then, of course, the third set of data is the laboratory results because the, talk, the, the doctor took some blood out of me and we sent them off to the lab and that's fine. That maybe comes back the next day. And then, after all that, the doctor writes me a nice letter saying, Dear Dermot, lovely to see you on Tuesday. You know, Hamid Loma's a bit low, maybe get some iron tablets, or maybe it's something more sinister, like your white blood cell was a bit, account was a bit uh, odd. You know, we might bring you to hospital. So, there was an outcome, right? What, we, what we've done in full health is we've got doctors to think about how they can pull themselves back from all of that workflow where they don't need to be. They don't need to make appointments. They don't need to ask me questions. I can fill all that out at home right, in the comfort of my own. And I'd argue that when you're filling them out at home, those, those, those questionnaires, you do a better job because you're not under pressure in front of the doctor, right? Panicking, thinking, what's the How answer? many drinks do you drink? Exactly. Uh, no, 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 no. So, so then what we do is then we, 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 and then like Anne's example about the pharmacy and Martin just mentioned it, you don't need a doctor to draw blood or to take a heart rate. You can have pharmacists, phlebotomists, you can have this done out in the community at scale. And then all you're doing is you're gathering all that information back to the doctor. So finally, we have the doctor where the doctor's required. But you could have, like Anne said, 500 people on a dashboard. And that's what we do in this software. You could have 500 people on a dashboard in front of a doctor. And you know what? 475 of those people, there might be nothing going on, which is great, right? Because we can push them all through and release this capacity. And now the doctor is going to focus on the 25 people where a medical intervention is required. It might be a phone call. Listen, buddy, you need to go and look after this or go and have a chat with the GP. Or it could be something worse like, and this always happens, by the way, if we do 100 people, there'll be three or four. You need to walk into A&E and have a chat right now. And that always happens with our with our data. And we've done hundreds of thousands of people through this. So so what you've done there is you haven't multiplied the efficiency of the doctor by, by 10 or 20, but it's by, by hundreds because there's no physical way a doctor can see all those people. So what we've done is removed all the people the doctor doesn't need to see, given them some really good advice, saved the doctor 30 minutes of explaining numbers and data, made the people more aware. And, and, and then we've got the doctor's attention on the people that matter. And then finally, the, the other thing that I really love, this concept of gamification of data, we all love to beat our best scores and so forth. We, you know, I, I, I cycle. So there's a thing called Strava that some listeners might know about. And I'm, you know, you're posting your kilometers and all this kind of stuff. But we find the same thing happens with our data. I mean, we, we're, we're kind of familiar with this with Apple Watches and Fitbits and we know how many steps we've done and we know our heart rate. But really what we should know is what's our lipids number and what's our cholesterol and all these. These are the really, the secrets that are in your blood. This stuff's really important. 
And if we can get this awareness out to people, number one, we'll make people not get sick. So, so there's two things are happening there. Number one, you're making people's quality of life better. And number two, you're saving governments, you know, HSE, NHS, all these entities, you're saving them stacks of cash because we're keeping these people out of hospital. And, and, and you know, this is basically is what Martin's talking about, this idea that if we need to scale this up massively, stop the bottleneck. The bottleneck is the doctors and leverage those, those pharmacists. Uh, and this is the spearhead, actually, of a whole new digital health and wellness system architected from the ground up. If you look at where all the cost is, all the suffering is, 70% of deaths are from chronic diseases that, you know, have been unmanaged or undetected. In the U.S., 90% of the total cost is from chronic diseases. This is a war on disease, mm. and Anne and Dermot are on the front line of it. And, you know, it's working. You know, this month we've got 500 patients. Citizens are going to show up to five or six Care Plus pharmacies in 15 minutes. We'll go through the whole process. Within 24 hours, they'll receive a personal electronic health record, They'll receive a you know, written in plain English report that tells them you're good or here's what you need to do. And I'll also walk out with a fitness device and a wellness therapeutic. It's so simple. It's As Dermot mentioned, gamification. Where we want to get to is digital closed loop management and what Full Health Medical, they're the integrators and the drivers behind a whole new way of, of managing health. And this is, as I keep saying, the business show, not that great medicine show. <laughs> so what I want to know from both of you, this is a business. Are you going to go international with it? Can it go international? And or is anybody else doing something similar? And it already is international. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, well, I mean talk to us. <laughs> Tell our, the world. So one of our top clients is one of the largest oper uh, uh, operators of hospitals in the UK. They do corporate medicals for 235 corporates across the UK. Very big names, all the kind of household names you'd recognise. And uh, as they built the company uh, over the years, they bought, uh, you know, smaller um, uh, private health care companies. So the challenge they have is if they're doing like, you know, say, a, a, you know, a big shopping name, for example, in the UK, superstores, if they're doing the employees in Devon, the doctors carrying out the, 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 the medic assessment might have a different output than the doctors in Birmingham or Nottingham. And that means, you know, that that means that means risk, right? Because you know, if you've got different doctors giving different outputs for the same uh, effective inputs, you now have have risk in your books. And so, one thing they want to do is reduce variation of output across the doctors. And what that allows you to do is, at the very top level, decide what your clinical governance looks like, and and that saves you bucket loads of cash all the way down because it's all consistent, and it also reduces risk for you in terms of a business. So yeah, we have uh, UK clients, we've got loads of clients in Ireland. And the reason I'm involved now is because we want to, you know, take it further afield. To where? Uh, so across Europe is the is the obvious next choice. Uh, we have all the challenges in software development with multilingual output there because we actually have to employ doctors to help us translate because, you know, it isn't like, you know, Google Translate. <laughs> you know, some of these terms are a bit more complicated. So that's basically where we're going with the company. Uh, uh, just to mention, that variability is perhaps the biggest issue you know, across healthcare globally. Mm. And the beauty of this solution is it actually codifies in actually the best clinical knowledge. So if you're in Devon and you're using these algorithms, I imagine you're actually using the best clinical knowledge. So you're getting superior actually, performance in every it's location. It's even better, Martin, because what they've done is they pull in cons like specialists to write the modules. So the, the, cardi the cardiac bit will be written by a cardiologist. The liver bit will be written by a liver specialist, and and so actually, what you're doing is you're bringing the best you can find out there and making that your your consistent. So it's it's ten x smarter, it's ten x faster, it's it's ten x cheaper. You know, this really is a revolution. Can I take a risk? Because we, we we called you're John. Gonna, you'll take any risk you want, but just call it tenfold or ten times. <laughs> oh, it's the ten x. Nobody <laughs> says ten x. I bet you in two years' time, everybody's going to be saying ten x. So your man, 10X I just got my ten x prescription. Ten x is on the radio again. Yeah. <laughs> But I, I actually think Anna and Dermot are actually the carpenters of the healthcare <laughs> industry. They make beautiful mu music, they make it look effortless and they're going to sell millions. Oh, I see. You don't mean a tap-tap carpenter. 
You're showing your age, Martin. Yeah. Well, the carpenters for I'm you two. I'm still or, there. I'm, I'm there. I'm, I'm yeah. <laughs> Final question. You know what I'm going to ask you? Because we ask this of everybody on That Great Business Show. Anne, who would you hire in a heartbeat? <laughs> and you, so, I'm asking both of you so separately. We, well, actually, because we had a little row about, we argued this, about this outside. We had a little <laughs> argument because, you see, um, if given my choice, I have to be truthful and obviously, um, uh, but given my choice, I was going to suggest Liam Neeson as voiceovers for the report because I think, like, you know, the reports are really impactful. You go on a patient portal and you look at all these graphics and it's all, you know, nice and here's your normal and all this, you know. But imagine you have Liam Neeson's voice over it going, your blood pressure is 140 yeah. or 19. <laughs> Wouldn't that, idea. wouldn't that yeah. be something you see you know oh, you have to drive it home this How is the whole Marlon point. Monroe for the guys well this is for we are <laughs> you're very sick <laughs> <laughs> you better see a doctor yeah. <laughs> does that work well, oh, no, I, I disagreed because um, so I, I've I lived in London for 30 years so I'm not the guy to speak to when it comes to Irish sport I, I don't actually know that much and find it hard mm-hmm. to follow but I've become aware recently of, of this chap called Davy Fitz, right, who in, yeah. in, in Irish um, <laughs> uh, hurling in football is obviously a well-known manager. And so I, heard, I saw a, a, a TV program about him and I watched him screaming at people saying, get up there, get after the ball. And he's, he's out. I mean, the guy was just full of passion. It was amazing. So I think he would be the voiceover that I would have for our reports because I can just imagine him coming out going, you could send an, an audio file to somebody. Your cholesterol is 6.1. What are you doing? Put down the chocolate cake. Get out there and go for a run. So I'd use him. But as Anne would tell you, he probably looks like he's uh, under a lot of of uh, blood pressure <laughs> so probably not a good thing I don't know anyways and Short Dermot Short thank you so much for joining us on That Great Business Show thank you thank very you. much thank you thanks Dermot thanks Anne That Great Business Show Irish Podcast Awards 2022 Best Business Podcast nominee Viscosity when you shave you want the highest viscosity because it helps the blade run smoother De facto, the world's best shaving oil has incredible viscosity. That's why De facto leaves your face, underarms or legs nick-free. Higher viscosity makes blades last longer. De facto is the best for your skin and your pocket. DeFactoShave.com All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. Next up we have a delightful guest. I say that because Una Kearns, founder of My Patient Space, says that her software has, and I quote, a delightful user experience. Out of nearly 600 patients surveyed, 99% of them reported using My Patient Space that had improved their healthcare experience and was, and I love this, intuitive to use. I haven't used it. I'm taking their word on it. So, what is it? What's so delightful about it? And how is it going to change the world? Una Kearns, welcome to That Great Business Show. Okay, thank you very much, Connell. It's a real pleasure to be here. How say, are you going to change the world? Okay, well, in a few different ways. So, I suppose a little bit of background into my patient space. So, um, I founded my patient space back in late 2017. I had a strong history. I was in Silicon Valley. I led software development with EMC and brought many products to market. And you get to a stage in your life where you really want to have an impact. And that's really where I came up with the idea for my patient space. So we wanted to take a lot of the know-how we had building out enterprise platforms, but applying it to the healthcare sector. And really, our ultimate goal was to improve the patient experience for millions of patients globally. And I'd like to say we're kind of well on our way there. So right now, we've got people in the desert in Kuwait using my patient space over to South America. So that's been really, really proud for us as a small Irish company. But so what do we do and who do we serve and how do we make a difference? Okay, so what we provide is a no-code platform for digital health. And you might say, what does that mean? I I, would say that actually. Yeah. A A no-code. A no-code platform for digital health. So I was listening to your show from last week and a lot of conversation came up around Stripe. Okay, so what does Stripe do? Stripe makes it very easy for all organizations to provide payment processing without having to worry about how payment processing works. We do the same for digital health. So what we provide is a complete platform that's turnkey with configuration without having to go to code. We can roll out multiple different types of digital health solutions that really help scale 
um, digital health offerings and bringing care back to the community, working with the HSE, working with global pharmaceutical companies to roll out their own digital health offerings. And I can give you some examples. But the nice thing about this is it's really a 10x, 10x, both from a technology perspective, because what we allow you to do is to roll out solutions cheaper, much quicker, but really, really with a high quality, as you can see from from the reviews that you've read about our product. But more than that is we we have huge scalability with our products. So we can go across any type of disease area, any type of language, any type of region. And that's why we're now deployed globally around the world. And what's very nice about this and the work that we're doing here in Ireland right now today is the impact it has. Because what is a no code? No code means we can rapidly configure across different types of treatment journeys. We've been doing many, many different pilots and projects here across Ireland with Martin Curley and with the Digital Health Transformation Team. And they all have such massive impact. So the product is 10x and getting a solution to market, but the solutions that are produced on the product also provide 10x benefits. And I'll give you some examples. So one project we're doing, which is really, really interesting, is up in Donegal at the moment. And this is a really, really nice story because it's combining two actually Irish um, healthcare companies, both My Patient Space and another company called PMD Solutions and their product Respirosense. And what's really nice about this is this actually came from the vision of one of the nurses that are there. So she really felt that she's all these patients across Donegal who have very, very serious respiratory illness. And what happens is they have to keep on coming back into the hospital the whole time. When they come back into the hospital, they can be there for over seven days. And the cost of that to the healthcare sector is one thing. It's over 7,000 and euros per potentially each stay. But beyond that, it's the quality of life for those patients. They're never home, okay? Now, what she had the idea is what they're monitoring in the hospital with the respiratory rate, why can't we do that in the community? So within two weeks, we were able to get up and running really with a solution up in Letterkenny, combining together with another Irish company, PMD Respirosense. And it's been really, really su- successful, this pilot. So they've been able to keep all patients across Donegal in the home without having to come back into hospital. They've been able to self-manage themselves, don't they have to take antibiotics earlier. And basically, it's really improving their quality of life, but reducing huge costs and, and stay and as I think, well. And what we've seen mm. in Donegal, and I think it's yeah. a fantastic shout out to PMD mm. as well, is 100% success rate. Mm-hmm. So normally these patients will be hospitalized five or six times yeah. a year. Continuous, yeah. And every single person that's mm. on this technology yeah. has had an exacerbation yeah. and the hospitalization yeah. has been stopped. And Colin, can I give a yeah. shout out yeah. to yeah. Una? Absolutely. Actually, mm. Una is what a fantastic role model. And we also look at 10x in terms of actually what people deliver. You know, mm. some people, they do what they can get away with. Some people meet the minimum requirement and some people exceed. But Una is 10x. She does whatever it takes and that's why her company is so successful. In the early days of COVID, Una came in. We ran a mini competition. We needed a configurable platform that could provide different solutions. You know, Una's company came out on top and all of a sudden they were in James's, they were in, you know, Tala, they were in, you know, St. Vincent's, they they were in Beaumont. And this 10x mentality in terms of whatever it takes is actually, you know, Una's got a great product, but what's more important actually is actually the ethics, the drive behind her. She's a fantastic role model. And we have a lot of good female entrepreneurs in, in digital health. And, you know, Una, you know, Anna, Anna, um, the, the Anna O'Leary from Vodafone, she said, you know, you can't be it if you can't see it. And mm-hmm. Una, you, you oh, see Phil, it. Oh, thanks very much, Martin. But I think one thing I'd like to bring out, which is even more, is the clinicians across Ireland. So we're doing so many different solutions. So right now it's Letter Kenny with respiratory in the home. We're working across all the oncology groups as well, really helping patients in the home and cancer treatments. With renal in St. James's, there's nearly a thousand patients on this managing at home on chronic kidney disease. And um, we're also just finished um, this really interesting pilot about moving the diagnosis of sleep apnea back to the home right now with the staff, with with Professor Brian Kent and um, Peter Koss, and then with St. James's again with, with Donald Sexton, but even back to Letter Kenny, it was actually the vision of the clinical staff there. So Antoinette Doherty had the vision to do this, and it's the drive of the clinicians who really care so much about the patients, which is just so rewarding and making a difference. And it's a combined thing together that And I'm really smiling powerful. because you have no, zero, Quack, kind of background in medicine. 
Well, it's funny actually. Yeah, I don't. I don't necessarily. Phew, but for a second, I'm going to say yes. Well, well, no, no, no. But I, I actually, I, I suppose, I grew up with medicine. My father was a doctor. Everybody in my family are doctors. Everybody around me. I was a dark horse. I actually went into computer science. I had a computer science at Trinity, and then I moved to the states. But what I did do in the states, the software that I built and drove, is is used by all the top pharmaceutical companies in the world, really to drive drug development. So I suppose I've always been surrounded and fascinated by medicine and that intersection of technology and medicine, even though myself, but I'm learning an awful lot as we go. Uh, and from a business standpoint, Conor, what is so important, what UNA is doing, we open innovation 2.0 mm. is the methodology we're using in Ireland to drive the structural change. And one of the core patterns is a platform. Mm-hmm. And what UNA is providing is a platform. Yep. And all of these, you know, motivated, smart doctors are using the platform. And the power of a platform from a business standpoint, it's a, it allows massively distributed collaboration and innovation. So that is the power of what UNA is bringing, this no-code environment. So in the past, you might have X number of programmers to help an individual doctor build a solution which was standalone. And what UNA has brought is this platform that can operate in the field in Letterkenny, it can be down in Kilkenny, it can be down in Kerry. It's all standard and it's inter- interoperable. And you know, what's most exquisite is actually designing for adoption. Those numbers, you know, I don't think I've... Maybe Apple can claim 100% satisfaction, you know, but it's not right, 100%. But, but it's, it's not 98%. 100%. It's 98 or well, it's, 99. Yeah, fair. It's in the 90s, generally. Yeah, it's which in the is, 90s. Which yeah, it varies depending which on is, which, which pathway you're looking at. Yeah, you and you it's, it's an app that fronts a digital pathway. So just completely changing the way the care is given. And it's not just the patients that like it, and I don't work for it, I'm not selling their product, but the clinicians like it as well. And it's you know, completely changing the productivity and efficiency of the nurse to patient communications, doctor to nurse, doctor uh, to patient. So it is a 10 times or a 10x technology. It's <laughs> not like say 10x, 10 yeah, times. Yeah. Now, do you know what I just had? I've had a thought. There's one for you. Both of you, because Martin, as we know, is ex-Intel, you're mm. ex-EMC. Correct. It really, kind of really brings it home to mm-hmm. me now about where we are going with medicine. It mm-hmm. is now going to be, first of all, we know it's digital, but it is technology. It's not medicine as it used to be. And I actually think, Conal, I'm sure you'll Mm. agree, digital health is a new discipline. It actually covers four disciplines and they're converged. There's health, there is technology, there's economics and demographics. Um, And when you put them together, you get this whole new discipline. So in the future, there won't be doctors, as we know, there will be digital doctors, there'll be digital nurses. But AI will be able to do a lot of this, as you know, Dermot, you know, proved, uh, we will be told, actually, you're starting to get sick before we even um, know it. And that is the opportunity where we can be looking at your Fitbit and the various, and we can see actually a temperature rise in Ratgar. 50 people have suddenly had a one degree rise, there's something going on and in Rathgar, and we can actually intervene and... Um, There's a party on. Yeah. But, <laughs> well, I, but, 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 but I do think to add in there is I think really technology and digital health can enable doctors do what they do really well. I don't think anything's going to take away from a doctor, you know, doing their job and that, that, that's sacrosanct she's, for she's years. She's covering herself with the family. <laughs> and no, 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 but, no, but I think it's really where technology can make it much more efficient, a better experience for them, a better experience for the patient, and they can concentrate on what they do really well. You know what I mean? And we're, we're just seeing that across the board in the different areas. So, and and also the the teams are just so encouraged about what they want to do and what they, what they want to drive. Now, you have already told us that you have world class experience mm-hmm. in Silicon Valley and beyond and so that kind of answers my next question which I am asking every mm-hmm. other company mm-hmm. here is about scalability mm-hmm. and about adoption internationally yep. and because I'm really interested in Irish companies like yours yep. going abroad and becoming huge you mentioned Stripe mm-hmm. I'd like you to be as big as Stripe Okay well thank you well well, I think we built this from the ground up as an international global product. And as the an in- we is who? No. It, it, it's, it's ourself and our team. So, so there's, there's a number of us. We're all ex-EMC. We're all ex-EMC and we've all worked together for decades. And our team has decades of experience about building out enterprise class platforms. So we've brought that to digital health and that's a key differentiator for us. We've done this before across other sectors and what we've done is we've applied this to digital health and that's why we can deliver these projects. So right now we actually are global and we're going global virally. So even with major pharmaceuticals now, we've rolled out right now all across Ireland, 
Israel, across the Middle East, and now across Latin America. So we're, we're making really great traction right now, and they're just fantastic projects to be a part of. We're working on programs for diabetes management across the Middle East, for severe asthma management across Israel and Ireland, and working across a lot of oncology projects across South America. And what's so good, it's really trying to improve the experience for patients and to capture and help patients be caught earlier on their disease journey. And one of the areas, Conal, that we also see is actually a 10x growth or 10 times mm-hmm. growth in our the GDP contribution of digital health. And it's you know mm-hmm. companies like Unis that are going to spearhead that. You know, right now, we're not particularly a strong player, uh, but we're about to announce what we call the first 25, which is the top uh, 25 digital health SMEs that we're working with in the HSE. Three years ago, that was one company. Now, actually, we're in the 30s or 40s, but we have... 25 companies that we hope to announce actually in New York and big program at a UN event. And you know, Una is company is my patient space up there with the top four or five. I'm one of the most geographically dispersed companies. So it's not just about health, but that's what it's about enterprise growth as well. So, you know, digital health is not despite having the med tech companies and the, the pharmas, you know, we're not a strong player, but we are going to be hopefully a world force uh, in the next five to ten years in digital health. And I think our difference from a company, we went to digital health differently to many other startups. Initially, digital health was about people were building, this is my diabetes app, this is my X app. We didn't go from that perspective. We built it as a ground up, as a platform, because we felt the biggest impact we could have was being able to allow those who serve patients today do it an awful lot better. And we also believe where we see the world is there's going to be millions of mini solutions out there because every clinical setting is slightly different. There's so many different disease pathways and you want to be able to provide your own bespoke you know, digital companions for patients to support them. And that's what our platform enables. Again, I'm smiling because... When did you, I mean, you mm-hmm. said that you're, it was a family background in medicine, but when did you actually really, really adopt medicine for yourself? Um, I suppose I've, I've always kind of been fascinated with medicine. But I'll tell you, so but basically what happened is I took an exit. Okay, so our, our company, I was very, very senior. I was up to CTO of the content management division of EMC, which is a multi-billion dollar division. Um, so I represent. Well, when you took an exit, does that mean you took a pile of cash? Well, and well there was did cash. Yeah, yeah, no, no, there was cash. No, what happened is when EMC and Dell merged, they sold our division to our competitor, Open Text in Canada. And, you know, at every stage, you kind of make a decision about what you're going to do with your life next. And I've, I, I know that's for many, many startup people. But for me, I started many, many different products. I was always the starter. I won the Founders Award for Innovation in Silicon Valley for Documentum. I was always a starter. But I always wanted to do something myself. But for me, I wanted to do something that had impact. Impact was huge for me. You get to stage. I wanted to do something that was going to make a difference. And foremost of anything else, our company is impact driven. We want to make a difference. We're doing this because we really want to make a difference in patients' lives. And I really felt it was so broken for patients. It was so broken the healthcare experience. And I felt our experience, we could apply what we did in the enterprise contact management space across many different areas to digital health to make it much better for patients. And that's where we came from. You are a wow. (laughs) <laughs> no, you really are. I am listening to you and I'm kind of a cynical old fella and I'm just listening mm-hmm. to you and your story. Mm-hmm. That's a wow. Right, yeah. And there's more because Una's also taken and we have the Irish Digital Health Leadership Steering Group, which is a group of about 80 leaders that are committed to transform our healthcare system and Una stepped up and she's leading our architecture working group. So since that, 2004, we've had a strategy for information systems, electronic health record, but we haven't been able to deliver and Una's leading that group in her spare time. Well, uh, I've, I've a lot of experience. Her spare time, I no, bet no. you don't have any of that. No, no, I've, I've a lot of experience with standards. So I would have done a lot of that in Silicon Valley. So I was on the board of Your directors for Oasis. Your is worth so much. I mean, no, really, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. But I can hear it. It's fantastic. <laughs> I don't know about that. But, but I think what we want to do is shepherd the people her. together. I'm going to tie her up and keep her here. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be for me. Before we let you go, yeah. Una, who would you hire in a heart? I know that was such a hard question, and I've been okay. So, so part of it is I, I, I could give you a kind of a quick answer, okay? But I was really thinking about this, and I was thinking about the stage of our company, and also the privilege of where I've been in my career and what I've seen and what I've seen other people do. And I really feel for us now we have the product. There's no doubt it's completely proven. It's gone across geos. What we need now is scalability, and the more we can impact patients, is the more scalable we can get. Okay, so right now we're small, we're bootstrapped, we've got where we are but we wanted to get it to this stage ourselves. 
Now, if I take a look at it, there's a number of people I had the fortune of working with before in my career who've taken companies and really scaled them out. So I, I'm going to list one or two people. You're allowed to do that. Am I allowed to do that? Am I allowed to do that? Okay, the first person that came to my mind when this came up is somebody I have such admiration for is a man named Jeff Miller. And Jeff Miller, he came in as the CEO of Documentum and he sold Documentum to to EMC for 1.5. He grew it up to to sell it to EMC for 1.5 billion. He's on the board of directors for ServiceNow, but he also runs in Santa Clara, the social entrepreneurship whole investment program. But he is probably one of the biggest role models I would have in my working career. So I sat in front of him as a young, in my early 20s, and I said, I want to change the company, what the company was doing, Documentum around XML. He looked at me and said, OK, how much money do you need in it to do this? I don't know why he would have any confidence in me to do that. I still look back and say, why did he do that? Do you know what I mean? But he... he had... sound very plausible. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I did then, but anyway. Mm. But no, but, he, but he, t- he took faith. Do you know what I mean? But what he created was just so marvellous. That company, the Documentum company, it's like a family now. We still are feel like a family. Everybody feels like a family. And we all work so hard because we all thought we were shaping and doing something that's for the good. So we were building, the mantra was we're building software to help find a cure for cancer quicker. Do you know what I mean? With the farm. And we all worked really hard on that. But it was that, it was that whole mindset and camaraderie and being able to grow a company like that with with the right um, the right feelings, you know what I mean, and, and the right reasons behind it. Do you know what I mean? So ethics and all the rest is really, really important to me. The other two people I had the good fortune well, sorry, of working you with... You've got the two now, do you? No. <laughs> okay, I've got to go on. Ah, no, 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 But they're further along, but what they did is they moved on from when I would have worked with them. One person called Judy Cullivan, another one called Whitney Baug. And one went on to be the CEO of Box. So she took Box and scaled out Box when it went to another area. And Judy, Was that Judy? No, that's um, Whitney Baug. So, and she, she's now a venture partner in some VC firm in the in Silicon Valley. But she was able to come in and scale out operationally wise. And Judy Cullivan did the same with many companies as well. But what they've done is they've been able to take a company on our side and come in and really know how to scale it. Because that's a different skill. It's a different skill taking a company and coming up with the ideas and driving it. But pure operationalization is a different skill. And the biggest power a company can have is as it scales. So I think that what we need like next is people to come in on board who really help us scale and operationalize what we're doing. Sorry. Is that do, a, do not be sorry. Probably Jeff, along with Judy the question. and Whitney, you're all hired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And that is Una, Una Kearns of My <laughs> Patient Space. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, well, thank you very thank much. You, it's Anna. been a pleasure. Well, thank you. Bye-bye. Show. Bye-bye. Thank you. That Great Business Show Irish Podcast Awards 2022. Best Business Podcast nominee. Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRedCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy-to-use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices, and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRedCloud.com, 100% Irish-owned and a proud member of Team GBS. All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. That great business show. Red Zinc, based in Dublin's Guinness Enterprise Centre, is a software as a service or as Martin might say, SaaS company that gives real-time video communication solutions to the healthcare industry. Its blue eye hands-free device can be worn by paramedics to send real-time video to remote experts. Those experts are then able to assess the situation through the video and make crucial decisions faster. And that's good. The company said it can also be used by medical professionals to observe hospital patients in isolation while sending live streaming video to a team of experts elsewhere. Donald Morris is CEO at Red Zinc. Donald Morris, welcome to That Great Business Show. Thanks, Colonel. Great to be here. Really a uh, pleasure to uh, meet you all and uh, have a nice chat. Well, you have been at this a while. That's right, yeah. We started Red Zinc in 2004 as a research and development company, and we developed a technology for a right-of-way on the internet to make a priority on the internet. And we were doing just lots of research and development with the European Commission and telephone companies, telecoms companies, public wireless companies. And at one point, they suggested to us, you should use this technology to help save a life. And that's how we got into the medical sector. Wow. I'd never heard of this. Yeah, so basically, um, it's like a bus lane. So you have outside 
We have a bus lane. The buses can go faster. The taxis can go faster. Police cars, ambulance can use the bus lane. But the internet can slow down and there can be congestion in the internet. So we just developed this technology with companies like Orange and Deutsche Telekom and Portugal Telecom and different telecoms operators because that's a strategic thing that they needed. I love our little companies, and maybe I'm being unfair at saying little companies, but little gems that we don't know about. And, and you are you're playing a world game. And Conal, this is a company that out Zoom Zoom or out Team Team because actually before anybody in the world had actually in Ireland had heard of you know Teams or Zoom, Donald was working with us, and uh, like a little more than ten days, you had stood up a, te- a virtual teleconferencing solution with St James's Hospital and Mental Health, and it it was weeks, if not months, later before. You know, the big guys came on the scene, isn't that right? That's right, yeah. So we showed you, I think, one of our solutions for uh, basically to send out a link to be able to connect a patient to a doctor in a few seconds, uh, no app needed. And we showed you that, I think, at the very early in March. And by the middle of March, we, the service, stood up for several hundred users in the HSE in St. James's. And we were really delighted to. We, we pulled out all the stops, uh, rolled up all the sleeves and made the whole service happen uh, straight away, really. Tell me, because I was obviously looking at your website, tell me about this thing that uh, you you can, maybe I'm paraphrasing too much, I can watch an operation as it's live. That's right. So we have uh, one solution which is called Blue Eye Hands Free. So Blue Eye Hands Free is a small camera that can be worn by a clinician, a nurse, a doctor, an ambulance technician, a surgeon, as they're doing a task. And the video can then get sent over 4G or 5G to a remote location. And somebody else can be in a remote location and can be virtually present, can see. So the doctor doesn't have to uh, hold a camera um, they can just wear something really, really small on their head and they can be doing their action. They can be doing a teaching. So one of the applications is teaching, uh, teaching at the bedside and showing it to third parties who are learning. And um, uh, it, it really, it's really beneficial during Corona because they don't want to bring people, can't really bring students so much into the hospital because of Corona risks. And there's a whole idea of bringing people outside the hospital and uh, shift left and stay left. So this all of the... This so it's really a 10 times, shift if not a 100 left. times. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> a 10x technology. Yeah. Yeah. No, it very much is shift left. And actually, I think this is one of the actually immediate opportunities. So instead of bringing 20 patients in around a patient, the consultant is treating and explaining, we have 300 people um, Yeah, because connected. every year you've got hundreds of students. So hundreds of students are coming in and these students need to be able to see at the bedside. But if the doctor or the teaching professor is wearing the camera, then you don't have to have so many students. The students can be uh, shifted left and they can stay left. They can be at home <laughs> learning. They can be... They can pass out at home. Yeah. <laughs> now, of course, this can only work for, for you don't have to touch. So if you're doing a measurement, if you're doing something with a thermometer, um, but, but a lot of the work process can be virtualized. A lot of the work process can work where you don't need to have somebody uh, right beside and you're touching somebody. There's many points along the patient pathway where you can virtualize it, where you can use video and where you can take the person who's who needs to be there and you can take them remote and that can that can reduce waiting lists and i have been asking because this is the kind of way my curious brain works of everybody on this particular podcast as to how much or what are you replacing or how as martin would say his 10x is 10 times or 100x is 100 times what are you going to do or what can you do or what are you doing so really we're we're looking to to do two things so we have it's video telemedicine. It goes in two dimensions. First of all, it goes in the dimension of pre-hospital. So in pre-hospital, you've got emergencies. You've got ambulances going out or you've got um, community nurses going to, to frail elderly people to help them along. But sometimes they need help. So an ambulance could need help at two levels. There could be a process where you want to stay left. So there's the, the strategy, the HSE digital transformation strategy is shift left, um, stay left, shift left, 10x. So the part where you have treated scene. So some ambulances are going to collect a patient and then they bring the patient to the hospital. But in low acuity cases, there is the potential to treat at scene. And that means stay left. And that gives you the opportunity to keep the patient, maybe re- administer some first aid, direct them to a different type of service in a scheduled way, keep them out of the waiting room and reduce the, the emergency department load. But you can only do that if you're able to give extra confidence to the paramedic, 
to the nurse in the field. And that's where Blue Eye Hands 3 comes in. They can wear the small camera. The small camera can be on their head and the video can go back over the 4G or the 5G network to a peer, a more senior paramedic, an emergency doctor who can help with that treated scene. And then you've got the the high acuity case where you want to uh, give more rapid help. So in some countries, they're bringing the doctors to the patients, but they don't have enough doctors in the ambulances. Um, In Ireland, they're bringing the the patient into the emergency department. But if the paramedic is able to wear the camera, uh, then they can uh, get help. And that can just... Uh, really win time and help save lives. And I know nothing at all about your camera, but is it a very special camera? Is it a very, very high definition? And or, or what does it do? I mean, I, I'm imagining a scene, car accident, dark, wet night, and uh, very, very low uh, visibility. Well, yeah, we've a, we've a torch mounted uh, option as well for nighttime. Um, but really, mm, the, the, he's on the, he's on the, wall. <laughs> <laughs> the whole idea is the simplicity. So, you know, some of those cameras that are out there, they're big. One doctor said, I don't want to wear that contraption. Ours is simple. It's really, we've had industrial designer on it for some time to make everything simple, um, easy to wear, ergonomic, um, lightweight. So ours is simple, unobtrusive, and it just, uh, it's, we call it hands free because you can. Uh, use it without your hands. And that's really uh, the part of our business that helps pre-hospital. And then there's another part of our business that helps in the outpatient department. So with the outpatient department, the big challenge is waiting lists. There's 600,000 people on the acute waiting list. There's a huge big waiting list as well for um, primary care. And using video, you can make the whole process more efficient and help to reduce the waiting list by getting resources to the right place efficiently and help to reduce that waiting list. And that's what we're helping to do uh, inside the hospital and outside the hospital. So, for example, you know, one of the solutions that we're exploring is virtual rehab. So instead of having one physio and one person doing rehab, you could have 16, 18 patients receiving, you know, virtual rehab with one physio monitoring what's going on. You can actually have vital signs being monitored. So a physio can actually see, well, what's happening to a person's heart rate or I need to slow down on this exercise. So... It's a 10x technology. So one Talk doing... me through that again, because I'm thinking of a virtual Pilates class or something like that, yeah. but nothing like that at all, is it? Well, actually, that's a re- actually yes. really good. It's, it's actually very similar. So a physio is giving exercise, which in the past would have been one-on-one, and now there can be 15, 20 patients actually receiving instruction from the same physio. But that and doesn't then... need red zinc, does it? That could be a Teams and or a, a, a Zoom or whatever. Yeah, but you want to be able to link it into the patient's records and all the clinical details. So okay. the whole idea of Teams is Teams and, and Zoom. They're kind of um, office-based programs for... And they, they, they need an app. Um, you mainly need an app. Our system doesn't need an app. Um, so it just, it just works straight away. There's a lot of complications to get into Zoom, get into Teams, and you don't want that This is the simplicity. The, what appealed to us in the first week of COVID was... You just send a text, you press the text and straight away you're into a two-way video call. It's the simplicity, um, you know, I think is is what makes this a killer app. Yeah, that's right. It's very very easy to use and very efficient. And when the physio or whomsoever is actually looking at me, is he, she looking at me and can see all of my medical details as well? Well, we haven't got that far yet. This is the basic platform. And what we're doing now is adding extra extra features onto it to to integrate it into other parts of the uh, the patient process to make um, it more efficient. We are discussing, for example, with Salasso, who will be uh, another company that's on our, you know, f- top 25 or first 25. And we're discussing an integration there where they provide actually a lot of, you know, pre-recorded video routines. And their whole mantra is movement is medicine. And the ability to capture real-time vital signs and display, display them to the physio. And there's some amazing technologies, you know, coming out, wearable devices that will actually, you know, do real-time ECG as well as, you know, standard heart rate, heart rate variability and so on. So um, we're in, we're coming to a Cambrian explosion. But what we need is platforms and what, you know, Red Zinc provides is a platform. So look, it's not just sort of a business app, but it's, about integration and we're, we're working with Donald to explore a living lab uh, where you actually have a window to all of the various applications that a clinician would need just on a single portal. And as you know, Donald, Martin has turned his back on filthy commerce, but I haven't. <laughs> and I want to know where Red Zinc can and will go worldwide. Worldwide. Well, so we're, we've got our business active in 
uh, lots of different countries in Europe. Uh, we've been partnered with uh, Philips, with uh, Telenor, with uh, Deutsche Telekom, with Telefonic, uh, really through the 5G public-private partnership to build new applications on 5G. So to give you an example of some of the applications we're doing, in, in Norway we're working with the urban search and rescue part of the ambulance service. So they really want to be able to have the scene commander to be able to see what's going on. At the moment, the scene commander can just hear what the forward crew... So if they're trying to rescue somebody from a building, uh, from uh, a fire, from a chemical spill, scene commander is always remote. But with our wearable camera, the scene commander can see. And they've said to us, this is the future. Uh, They're able to access the service and see it Uh, immediately and instantaneously. And we're doing another service with um, community nursing in Sweden in Vastris. Uh, The pilot there is, is they have a service where community nurses go to frail elderly patients uh, out of hours. So at the night time, during the weekend, during the bank holidays. And sometimes those nurses need a little bit of help. They need a medical, uh, they need a doctor to advise them. But the doctor might be it's a rural area, it might be in another faraway part of, uh, of, of of Asmanland County. So with our system, the, the nurse can uh, show the doctor um, she's treating the patient, the frail elderly patient. The camera uh, is seeing the frail elderly patient and the video is going back to um, the GP who's in a car somewhere or in an office, uh, maybe 100 kilometres away. And this is at night time or at the weekends. We have another one in Turkey where we're working with... Um, uh, one of the hospitals there, and they're f- looking at it from a disaster medicine point of view. So they have earthquakes in Turkey, and sometimes there's uh, there's damage, um, and there's people under. It's like the urban search and rescue. There's people under buildings, and they need they need medical help uh, immediately. So uh, this is, I think Donald, what you're talking about, and we haven't talked about this conal before, is network centric healthcare, which is actually based on the principles of network centric warfare. <laughs> Uh, so can you imagine warfare could be good? Well, we can take a lot of the principles of network-centric warfare, which were originated actually by a Rish- Russian general in the 80s, but the DOD and Pentagon have done a lot of work on that. But the core of what network-centric warfare, or one of the core ideas, is what's called SSA, Shared Situational Awareness, and what Donald is doing. So being able to create, you know, say, for example, the you know remote scene commander, they actually can now see and they have much better... Um, information than they otherwise, you know, would have available. And what we're doing with all of the solutions the companies have talked before is doctors are making decisions based on just 18% of the data available. Um, can you imagine, you know, a pilot flying a plane on just 18% of the data? And, you Martin, know, I don't like flying. <laughs> yeah. Don't go down there. <laughs> well, I think like if you look at that 18%, like like Ireland is a digital economy. A lot of the, the, the economy works in Ireland because it's digital, huge big digital companies in Ireland. But the health service, like how can we accelerate the digital transformation? How can we take the, the current 18% out of the current time warp that it's in and give that to you know 110% of information? How can we do that? And that's the digital transformation uh, challenge that we are, are working towards. Two final questions. One, how big will Red Zinc become and when? Well, we're growing very fast. Um, you know, there's there's ambulance services all over the world. None of them have this technology. And uh, we're, we're over the next three to five years, we'll grow, I don't know, very, very, very Say big. Say 10x and that'll be 10x, no, 20x, 20x. <laughs> we'll be growing 20x, 10x per year. And the final question, because that's what we all ask all of our guests on That Great Business Show. Who would Donald Morris of Red Zinc hire in a heartbeat. Oh, in a heartbeat, I'd like to hire Franz van Newton, who's the CEO of Philips Healthcare. He graduated around the same time, maybe a bit later than uh, earlier than me, uh, from business school, and he's the CEO of of Philips. He's been in Philips all his life, and uh, you know, Philips is a massive healthcare company, and I'd love to have his expertise. So scale. let me. I actually have. A, I know Hank van Houten, his brother, very well, Ooh. who's the CTO of Philips, and actually, to complete the story, actually worked for. The, both friends and Hank's father Wait a second, the two when I worked them, in Eindhoven. The two of them are in the same company? Absolutely, the CEO and the CTO. Now, they don't talk much. The no. relationships are cordial. <laughs> but, you know, Hank lives in Eindhoven and Franz lives in Amsterdam. But yeah, the rocks are a great company and they're actually one of the best exponents of Open Innovation 2.0 in the world. Yeah, so that reminds me of John Please. He wrote a book called uh, Families and How to Survive Them. So uh, maybe <laughs> they should have a read of that. That is Donald Morris of Red Zinc, and thank you very much for joining us on that uh, great business show. 
And that's it from Dark Great Business Show, episode 103. First of all, my hugest, the Gaurav Mahagat, to Professor Martin Curley for doing all the heavy lifting on this episode. He asked all those intelligent questions that I don't know anything at all about. And as I said at the very beginning, if you want to help change this country's health service for the better, email or WhatsApp a link to this podcast to anyone you think may be interested, your local GP, your local TD, or maybe a patient group that you might be involved with. This is how we, the patients, can demand and effect change. So I ask every week, share, share, share. Glad to report our podcast is in rude good health, so make sure you get out and exercise your franchise on our behalf. We're already Best Business Podcast nominated, but there's also a public vote at Irish Podcast Awards where you can send your favourite potty, that's us, your numero uno. Irish Podcast Awards will find the vote button. And this week's big question... Why isn't your business advertising with us? Great companies like Big Red Cloud, Microfinance Ireland, Virgin Media, they all do. Your business should do likewise. 65,000 listeners and 6,500 followers on LinkedIn. Our listeners are the creme de la creme. You can talk to them directly via this podcast with great value advertising. That's great value. That doesn't mean we're cheap. We record here at the Dublin South Podcast Studios where sound engineer Brian Begley and studio manager Peter Rice create the sound that helped us win that Best Business Podcast nomination. And if you want to record a podcast, do use the team here at the Dublin South Podcast Studios. They are great. And if you'd like the media group to produce a podcast for your business, then talk to me, Connell O. Or I'm Find me on LinkedIn. All of our great business insights and tips are brought to you, as always, Thanks to our sponsor, De Facto Shaving Oil, the world's best all-natural shaving oil. They back us. Please back them. DeFactoShave.com will get them. And that's where Martin Curley gets his De Facto Shaving Oil. You love it? Correct. No, it's it's wonderful. And don't forget to buy Business Plus Magazine, where we now have a regular column all about the podcast. So for me, come on, Mila Buechus, for listening on the Salon Tunnel.